Hey everybody, welcome to Technically Unraveled. I am Kristen Fehrenbach, the Senior Director of Microsoft Go-To-Market here at PAX 8. Thanks for tuning in this week. Make sure that you put all your questions and anything you have over in the chat. Also, please make sure that you like, share, subscribe because we've got lots of content that's upcoming. And I really like interacting with you all in the chat. So I want you to all come while it's a live show, please. All right, let's go ahead and get started with your updates. So first and foremost, we have the PAX 8 monthly newsletter that has gone out. Please make sure that you're checking out those links. Same links as last time, guys. Make sure that you're going in, bookmark it. You have so much information available at your fingertips refresh every single month. So please go check that out. Next, we've got Microsoft is only going to be accepting GDAP starting October 9th. You might have heard originally it was September 25th. We moved, well, not we, let's be clear. It was September 25th. Microsoft moved it to October 9th. So some of those fun date changes, we just want to make sure that you as partners, you know, October 9th is the day GDAP or nothing. All right, new FY24 incentives and rebates program has officially launched. We've talked a lot about this with Ashley Moretti, other people that have come on, but I want you to know as of October, we are live, ready to roll. Make sure that you are enrolled in the MCI program. So we wanna make sure that you're getting these incentives. Super important that you've either purchased your designation or your solution competency. Reach out to your account team if you have questions. This is super, super important. I wanna make sure that you don't have money that is in your account that doesn't get spent. So keep in mind that if you've earned under 10,000, you're gonna get that as a straight rebate. But if it's over that $10,000 threshold, you are gonna to need to make sure that you're going and claiming this. At the end of the half, it'll disappear. You'll never get this money back. So reach out to your account team if you have questions. It's all located in Partner Center. I was really excited last week about our PAX 8 Dynamics Duo, our campaign launching. Man, this website looks slick. You guys got to go check it out. Please make sure you check out these resources. There is a ton that goes into it. I mean, we really talk about this partner to partner motion here at PAX 8. We talk about you don't have to build your own Dynamics practice. Lean on us, lean on our professional services. We're here to support you. Your PSCs, your Productivity Solution Consultants, your SOCOs, reach out to these guys. They are going to take excellent care of you if you're interested in learning more about Dynamics. Highly recommend that Dynamics Demystification Session. That's your plug to go to PAX8 Academy. There's a Microsoft Hub there with all kinds of information. All right. Beyond, I, I, I don't know how we're already almost at the end of the year, but Beyond is going to come up before we know it. So right now they have early bird pricing. So let's go ahead and we make sure that you get your ticket secured. It's gonna sell out. Wanna make sure that you are there, we'll be there. It's gonna be a great time, a lot of content, but make sure that you get that ticket while you can at that discounted rate. All right, that wraps up our updates for today. Cybersecurity month is here. I am super excited to introduce Roger. Thanks so much for jumping on today. Kristen, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent, excellent. So we've got Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do here at PAX 8. Yeah, appreciate it. I'm, I'm the uh, part of the group. I'm the Director of Risk and Anti-Fraud. And my remit is looking at customer and partner risk. So what's happening in our customer environments? And we manage, as you know, a really large infrastructure, a lot of different customers in Microsoft. And so that's what I'm focused on, right? How can we look at their risk? And a lot of those risks are cybersecurity risks. So here we are this month, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about that. Awesome, awesome. I was, you know, I reached out when I was like, man, it's cybersecurity month. Hold on. I was like, please, Roger, it's going to be the perfect time. So we've gotten the pleasure to work together a bit. And, you know, it's the first question. It, 
it's not even like a softball question. So I'm just going to apologize out the gate, Roger, because there was a recent data link at Microsoft and an employee accidentally exposed 38 terabytes of data on GitHub. I mean, can you just kind of explain to me, like, how does this happen? I mean, what are the yeah. potential risks, some consequences? Because that's a lot of data. It's a lot of data. And so this happened something like three or four weeks ago. It was definitely the security story du jour, mm -hmm. right? So for that week, it was a big story. Uh, the next week, it was eclipsed by something else, right? So there was a casino hack and this kind of thing. And this is the way the security world works. We sort of move on. But this was a big story, and it was it involved a Microsoft employee that um, was publishing some data for artificial intelligence modeling, and uh, a lot of that going on now. And he inadvertently overshared, right? And uh, 38 terabytes, that's a huge amount of data. And he didn't intend to share that much data, but that's what happened. And um, this was found by a research group called WizIO. And you can go look it up pretty quick to Google that. And certainly if you're using, you know, storage from Azure, you'll probably want to have a look, especially if you've got a big distributed team. Um, but what happened was really common. So this is as this story is as old as cloud platforms themselves. Somebody stored some data in the cloud and then didn't secure it, right? They they provided some overly permissive settings that let essentially anybody use it. And I guarantee you've done this as well, right? Not picking on you. I've done it too in the last month. You've got a document to share and you're like, um, generate a link that if anybody has it, they can get to this document. Say you've got- Anybody, right? any organization, it's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got a bunch of internal people to send it to, but you've got some external folks as well. So you're just like, oh, just generate this link. And that link then is open to that document, no matter who's got it. Now, some enterprises, you know, will not let you share a link like that. Like it's got to be, you know, anyone at Pax8, for instance. But you can generate links that just, in, you know, if anybody's got it, they can access it. And that's something we call security by obscurity, right? You're just betting that that link won't get shared out somewhere or combed up in a big AI data set, right? And for the most part, you're right. But... That's not exactly what happened here because this user did intend to share this link. So he published it on GitHub, which is where he was publishing the related software. And um, it turns out that the link he shared, it's called an SAS link. It works exactly like a document share link, except it, it points at storage. And so uh, this link actually linked back to the entire storage system and not just the resource that he intended to share. And so that's what happened, uh, reported by this, um, you know, ethical researcher who informed Microsoft, Microsoft remediated the problem. And then of course the threat researcher released this data. Not really anything to oh. pick on here regarding Azure, but there are a few details that I'd like to, to cover that are specific to Azure in these SAS links. Please, please. Yeah. So one of the problem with these SAS links is that they are not time limited, right? So one of the things that happened in this event is that the link had actually expired, right? So I think it expired in 2021 and somebody really helpfully went back there and, and said, we'll put a new link in and they didn't expire it until 2051, the year 2051, right? So this is forever and it was, it was overshared and our, our, one of the other aspects of these SAS tokens is I can't log into Azure as an admin and see they exist. My users can generate them, distribute them, and I can't go in and revoke them explicitly. If I want to go revoke that token, I've got to go in there and kill a lot of different stuff. I've got myself a big problem. So I would recommend for our Azure storage users to have a look at this uh, because the article does describe some mitigations. You can do some logging so that it, you can tell that it's being used. Um, you can set some security settings so that um, only certain kinds of tokens can be issued that expire in a week, right? So there are some mitigations that that you can use to, um, to, uh, okay. to correct the problem. And I suspect that Microsoft is gonna do some updates to their you know, architecture methodology too, based on that event. I 
It sounds like it. And I mean, uh, luckily it was found, you know, it was contained, but I mean, would you be able to give us just some tips to hopefully prevent some of these breaches in the future? And I mean, how should we protect our own data online? I mean, I probably shouldn't click the any organization, which has been grayed out, might I say. So I can no <laughs> longer do that. But I mean, what are some good tips here? Yeah, so I think, you know, looking at this case, it was a huge amount of data involved and it was for AI training. And I would say we're going to start to see more and more customers go towards AI, right? But I think the key, the key here is don't treat it like a giant experiment because it usually is, right? We usually say, hey, we're going to get some really smart data scientists. We're going to give them an absolute massive amount of data as much as we can. And then we're going to let them see what kind of interesting stuff they can produce from that. But don't treat it that way. Don't treat it like an experiment because the results may be experimental, but the data that you're using is often very sensitive, right? So my advice is use the usual security concerns that you would with any massive set of data. Um, somebody came into your environment and said, hey, I'd love to get a copy of all your trouble tickets, emails, chats. Uh, your sales pipeline, your revenue, and then I can produce some magic analysis for you. You would never let them do that without a lot of scrutiny. And so that's what you want to do with these AI projects. Um, you know, we can see that there's just sort of a small segment of our population today using machine learning, but we know it's about to explode, right? So my advice is treat it like production data because it is. Got it. And I mean, there's a way to see through the Azure alerts, you know, what's being downloaded from my understanding. Can you kind of talk me through that? Because I mean, if that much data is getting downloaded, shouldn't somebody be yeah. going, hey, somebody should be going like that. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, enable that logging. So this this particular, you know, vulnerability uh, can be captured in logs and you want to do that. And you certainly want to, you know, track when anybody's when you see a lot of activity going on. But one of the simplest things that you can do is ena enable cost reporting on your account, right? This is for all our Azure customers and partners. Go in there and set up some alerts and you can make them specific as possible so that you know when costs are starting to escalate because a, a lot of times cost is just a great proxy indicator that there's a security problem, right? If I see a lot of data going out of the cloud and I'm starting to pay for it, I'm gonna go investigate what that is. And so the 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 cost alerting can, um, you know, be that canary that tells you, OK, I actually need to go do something. And we'll talk about some other, you know, security type concerns that cost reporting will solve as well. Awesome. So no matter where a partner is, right, I, I think, you know, there's never it's never too late to start down this journey of cybersecurity. Right. Whether you're at yeah. the ground floor, whether you're already a little bit into it. So, I mean, there's sys controls, there's hardening guides. Like, right. What do you recommend here? Because I feel like there's a lot. And how, how do people maybe know, yeah. hey, where, where should I at least begin to dig in? Yeah. I'm going to say something that I know sometimes um, our audience gets tired of hearing, but start with MFA. Start with MFA. It's so simple, right? get your passwords protected with MFA uh, on your phone or the other methodologies that are available because Microsoft says, and I think they're right, that will stop 99% of compromises. I like those odds, right? So start there. Same. And then, uh, you know, another thing that you can do, go look in Azure. Azure's great at telling you all the potential security things you might want to look at and prioritizing them. It'll probably be a big list. But Azure is great at telling you, start here and then do this and then do this. And then it will guide you into hardening your, your Azure and Microsoft environment. Got it. So that is the yeah. Azure score that you're specifically talking about? Yeah, correct. That's exactly right. And it's, it's not usually yeah. like one or two things. Like it's, it's a very long list. No. So it's going to be dozens. MFA is a it's good It's going to be dozens spot. of things. MFA is a good start. You're going to find dozens of things there, but as a business, and I think it's great to track this as a KPI, start tracking it with your IT security team that they report every month where that score is and give them incentives to drive that score up to 
And that way, you know that they've done absolutely everything they can do. Give them some incentives to do that, right? Something that, that, that makes it um, uh, something that they are inspired to go do. Let them report it every month. And then that will drive them to go and change the settings. And then sometimes the behaviors that they have to change in order to, you know, get a hundred percent score or something like that. Security is always a trade-off, right? You're not hundred percent secure, but you can go in and drive it up as far as possible and then let the business help you decide, Hey, we're actually not going to do that. We're going to accept some of that risk because that security mitigation right there is something that uh, we think is going to cost us more money than the potential risk would. So, um, but use that score. That's a, that's a great idea. Excellent. So they're going to get this list. I love the gamify. Like I really, I like the gamification gets people yeah. involved and they're saying like, Hey, how do I close that gap? Yeah. So I really like that one. Yeah. Now, if they're saying like, Hey, you know what? I, I kind of don't know where to start. I mean, they can leverage us as Pax8, maybe in pro serve as well from my understanding. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, they can leverage us. First of all, we've got Pax8 Academy. This is available on demand. Our partners are entitled to it. They can go in and get training across security concerns, productivity concerns, across the vendors that we support. It's a great resource. And one of the courses in uh, the Pax8 Academy regarding cybersecurity for Azure has to do with Azure unauthorized consumption. And this is one of the risks that we see for our customers, and they're often not aware of it. I think everybody knows, hey, I might get hacked, might be ransomware, some of my data might get taken. But what they're often not aware of is that some threat actors will actually drive direct cost to them. So this Azure unauthorized consumption usually involves an in customer user that's been compromised. The threat actor then takes that user's privilege and rolls out vast compute resources to mine cryptocurrency. And that then drives direct cost for the customer, not just sort of residual cost or resulting cost, but actual spend. And these things can escalate at about $1,000 an hour, right? So I encourage all our partners to go look at that course. And we're going to show you some prevention, yeah, prevention detection um, methods that you can use to prevent it, which is better or detect it, which is often required, right? Because there's no perfect prevention. Um, sure. But that's a that's a great resource. Goodness, you know, what's funny is Matt Lee has called me a threat actor because I got very excited at Beyond because guess what? He left his badge out and guess who the new Matt Lee was? Nice, nice find. Absolutely. So, you know, I really, he was like, man, I need that back. And I was like, I don't know. I, I no, found it, I so it's mine. About. Exactly, I don't know. So, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on because this is such an important topic. And I mean, that Azure course, it, please make sure that you guys go log in. And I do want to make that plug because Academy's free. If you are a Pax8 partner, right. you can go in, you can get access to that. So there's a lot of that. Pro serves are great to work with, but you know, I, I want to go a little further, Roger, into what exactly your team does, because right. it might not be somebody's like best day if they hear from you, right? It is not. It is not the greatest day when you hear from our team, right? So we've got a team of risk analysts that will contact you and we are proactively watching your infrastructure, okay? I'm not promising to find it all, but we are employing proactive management, especially for that un unauthorized usage concern where the cost can escalate so quickly. And so if you're a partner with Pax8, you may hear from us. If we see something like an unauthorized usage case, we're going to email you directly, right? We're going to call you. Um, we're going to, in the future, text you, right? So we've got an ability in the platform. Who's this sparingly? We're not going to text you all the time. But, and you're going to have the ability to opt in, right? So you can go in and say, okay, for this guy and this guy, Send them a text mm -hmm. if you have a security alert, and we'll be using that in the near future. But my advice is for our partners, you know, put in that contact information, put in phone numbers, make sure the main phone number in your partner record rings to a number. And if it offers us to connect to like your on-call person, we'll dial through. We'll call through because, you know, these are the cases where those costs are escalating so quickly. We do need you to make actually a, a response within a couple of hours. 
right? Or it's going to be $10,000, right? So we need you to do this. And it is rare. Listen, this is rare across our infrastructure. We support, you know, tens of thousands of Azure subscriptions, and this is not happening every day. But when it does happen, we do need to be able to get in touch with the partners in order to work with them. It is a bad day. We'll help you. Um, I get reactions all ranging all the way from great. I'll let you know when it's taken care of to, oh my gosh, I don't know where to start. Would you help me? And and we'll we'll do that, right? We'll help you because we've worked, worked a number of these cases. You probably haven't. And we'll help you do the triage and remediate. And then you can go on and make sure the tenant's secure, you know, after we stop uh, the damage from happening. So that's how you're here from us. And uh, you may hear from us in a couple of other ways. So Microsoft also will will tell us when, hey, this individual server is, you know, mining coin. That's not as urgent a need. It's still urgent to be done. It needs to be actioned right away. Uh, but this is typically where, okay, customers rolled out a, you know, third party VM, like a wireless LAN manager or even a firewall, okay. right? And Microsoft is saying, hey, that resource is actually mining coin. Um, we have had cases where the file, which is like the bastion for security, is itself mining coin. And that's something you've got to go fix, right? Because if somebody owns your firewall like that, mining coin is a concern, but the real concern is they're they're in there letting themselves into the rest of your infrastructure. So we'll open a case like that for you. Um, and then thirdly, Microsoft has come out with these new kind of alerts that are telling you that you have a vulnerability. So they don't see that something has happened, but they see that something might happen. We'll open a case for those two, right? And these are really interesting because Microsoft knows what you're doing pretty well. And so if they think you're vulnerable to something, you probably need to go take a look at it. And these are not noisy either, right? These are not, we're not getting hundreds of these a day or anything like that. It's not going to flood your inbox. But when you hear from us, uh, it's usually something you need to action. Goodness, you know, I mean, as Pax8 continues to expand, I feel like I find different little areas and different teams kind of nestled in. So, I mean, this wasn't even something that I was totally aware how much we did, but I mean, just right. having your team kind of just keeping an eye like, hey, you know what? what, what's going on here? And I mean, we met through the Azure fraud and what was going on. So, you know, right. super, super great resource through your team. So obviously anytime yeah. they hear from you, go ahead and respond to you guys, right? And we're not going to do yeah, like, that's right. they won't give me your phone numbers. Okay. I can't send you my marketing <laughs> campaigns guys. So make sure that's in there for these guys. Cause that's, that's huge. So that's right. Yeah. We really are there to fix a problem. Yep. Yeah. So there's privileged and sensitive users. And I mean, those get a little worrisome, right? So yeah. what happens with those in particular? And are there specific measures that maybe our partners can take to try to help those in particular, like those specific user types? Absolutely. Because that's who they're targeting yeah. more times from my understanding. 100%. So um, first of all, you do need to secure your obvious privileged users, right? Your global admins, your techie guys that have capabilities in your tenant. You've got to secure those guys. And you mentioned GDAP at the top of the call. That is the way to go for partners, right? If you're managing multiple customers, you want to use GDAP because then when somebody joins your company or leaves your company, GDAP will just automatically make sure that they don't have any more privileged in privilege in your end customer's account. But if you do, you know, deploy your own global admin account inside your end customer, you got to make sure it's secured with MFA. You got to do it. Think about the predicament that you might be in if your account inside your end customer's tenant gets compromised because it doesn't have MFA. And so that's the way to go for your privileged users. But what I want to tell our partners as well, that make sure your end customer's global admins are secure. Make sure that the global admins that they set up for their third party developers are using MFA. This happens. And if your in customer won't secure his own global admins and his third party global admins, get a waiver. Make them indemnify you because when those get compromised and something like an unauthorized usage happens or ransomware or some data gets taken, you know, you're the partner, you're managing that tenant make sure your customer understands that they are then responsible 
uh, for those users. And just lastly, right? Sure. Go ahead if your customers will do it and set up security defaults, right? Get everybody using MFA because mm -hmm. you're, uh, you know, it's not just the techie admins that are uh, a vulnerability or a risk. Um, your finance people and your leadership and your support guys, they're also a risk, right? Last year, uh, the federal government estimated that it was something on the order of $2 billion based on business email compromise theft, which is where somebody's impersonating you. We've seen cases where a threat actor uh, compromised a finance email box and wrote the customer's customers to send their payments somewhere else. Like, hey, we've changed our wiring information. Here's our new ACH. Please send your money there when you pay your bill. Uh, this can result in six-figure losses. So absolutely just go ahead and apply security defaults. Make everybody in those tenants use MFA. You don't have to use the phone, right? The phone's a great way to go, but you can use these little hardware keys. Um, if if, your, if what is your users that? you know don't want to use phone, this is a this is a hardware key that is an MFA mechanism and it doesn't require your users to have a phone app and to sort of answer, you know, type in the numbers, they plug it into their workstation. And then when they want to um, authenticate with MFA, they just press the button. So in some, it's, it's a little easier once it's deployed than, than phone-based MFA and it's every bit as secure. In fact, it's a little more secure. So that's what I recommend, yeah. right? Make sure all your users and your customers- I see them with them on their secure. keys sometimes. Like yeah. I see them pulling out keys, plugging them in, doing all of that. And, and I mean, not all MFAs created equal. You know, I know we've talked about yeah. this a little bit in prior uh, episodes, but I mean, so the FIDO key is one option, right? And that's not the phone, but what are the other MFA right. options that are available? So the, the next one that you probably want to use is, uh, especially if you're in the Microsoft environment, just use the Microsoft Authenticator, right? And go ahead and tick the option uh, where you use the additional matching code, right? So this is when, okay, you're trying to log in, your Authenticator app on your phone pops up and says, is that you logging in? And then it says, type in the two numbers that you see on the screen, right? And it's just you know, to, you know, 35, 52, whatever it is. And what that helps is it makes sure your users don't get accustomed to just saying yes, right? One of the problems, even with the app is that I'm trying to log in, my phone pops up and says, can I do this? And just out of, just out of habit, I just say, yes, yes, yes. Well, if that's a, if that's a threat actor, that's a problem, right? Two digit code then solves that issue by making you input something that you can see on the screen. And um, so if you can't see that, that's, you know, it's even more secure. And of course, we don't recommend any longer the plain text message MFA uh, because there is a vulnerability here, right? Um, just getting a text and typing that code back in, this is vulnerable to something called SIM swapping, where I can basically go steal your phone number, right? I go to Social Engineer, one of the telcos, it's Verizon, it's T-Mobile or AT&T. Right, this can happen to any of them, and I and I just steal your phone number, and then I get your text. Now that would be a that would be a long way around, right? That somebody would probably be targeting you if they did that. But if you're managing a lot of resources, if you're managing a lot of customers, you might be a target. So, you know, we recommend to use the hardware token or the uh, Microsoft Authenticator app with the second stage verification. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. So. I mean, we've gone through, you know, some of the steps that partners can take. We've gone through Academy and Roger, this might be the most important question of the whole day. Are you ready? I'm ready. Lay it on me. How do you feel about pumpkin spice lattes? I cannot disclose that information. That is uh, confidential, but I actually like them a lot. <laughs> Thanks for asking, <laughs> but I won't admit Good. it. Uh, okay, do. nobody will ever see this. Probably. Okay. Good Perfect. stuff. Roger, Just thanks so us. much for coming on. I mean, we're Pleasure. definitely going to have you back because I think that there's a lot more that we can unpack here. So until next time. Would love to. Thanks, Kristen. Excellent. Excellent. 
All right, everybody. Cybersecurity Month kicking off strong. Big shout out to Roger for jumping in today. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, because you are not going to want to miss Miss Britton next week interviewing David Powell. We'll see you then.